Great experiences build great leaders. Great leaders build great teams. This is Building Great Sales Teams. All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. I've got a good one for you guys today. I've got Greg Fisher with us. He's the CEO of Trip Shop and Wave Res. He's also the CMO of Limit Logon Attempts Reloaded and the host of Awkward Water Sports Guys podcast, which I was just actually on a couple of weeks back, and that's how we ended up here. As soon as me and Greg started talking, I knew I had to get him on the show. He's an expert in digital marketing, marketing with an expertise in PPC, and he sold 80 million tours on his website, Trip Shocks. As well as with Limit Login WordPress plugin, he has two point, I'm sorry, two million active users and five thousand paid subscribers. That's a hell of a resume, Greg. Welcome to the show. Uh, welcome, Doug. Glad to be here. Awesome, brother. Well, my favorite thing about it is honestly the dynamic between the two companies. I mean, obviously they're both web based, but at the same time, one is like water sports and fun, and the other one is like, I didn't even know that was an issue until I, I looked it up just like an hour ago, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it, honestly, it's a really great um, story to how I stumbled upon Limit Login Attempts Reloaded and how that business kind of took off. And, and frankly, that business is scaling so fast and growing so fast that I, I'm making most of my income now from this small little plugin that came out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, it, Basically, um, I, I have a business partner with all of my ventures, Alex Benko. And mm. I was just telling you, Doug, uh, Alex, um, he can speak a couple of different languages. Um, he was able to source a lot of great developers early on when we started TripShock and WaveRes to allow us to grow and scale. And honestly, if it wasn't for him, I would not be where I am at today. So when Alex and I decided that we had great synergy, we said, you know what, instead of us you know, uh, me just using your company for, for developers, let's, let's partner. Mm -hmm. So he had a current business, he had a hosting business and, and, and he outsourced developers to different companies. So yeah. we decided that let's combine our, our entities. So we did an equity swap mm -hmm. and I gave him half of my companies. He gave half of his. So uh, that relationship worked extremely well. I mean, he had a skill set that I needed. He need and he uh, needed a skill set that he needed, and mm -hmm. and that's just like a, the perfect, you know, uh, way Marriage. to make to make great partnerships, right? Yeah. So years later, um, we decided that we want to just go full, you know, uh, full scale on the on the travel agency Trip Shock, mm -hmm. and we sold his hosting business. And we made and it, it was it was still it was a good decent sale. We did six figure sale on it. Um, he had about 150 to 200 hosting clients, so it wasn't a big big hosting business. He made most of it on actually outsourcing developers. But mm -hmm. it's and if if you're in that business, you understand that it's it's very time consuming and it, there's a lot of headache with it dealing with customers and, and their websites. But when he sold it, there was a couple assets that I wasn't aware of. So during his years of operating that hosting company, he created WordPress plugins. And some of the plugins uh, just organically grew because they were very lightweight and everyone needed them. One in particular was Limit Log and Attempts Reloaded. So, you know, it wasn't until three, four years ago I uh, saw this. Uh, plugin and Alex started explaining to me. I go on to the plugin directory for WordPress. It had a million active users. Wow. And anyone that's in the software business, you know, a million active users, that's money. Like, yeah. you, <laughs> doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. And, and then he's, and he was also saying how somebody reached out to him and wanted to buy the plugin for a quarter million dollars. Mm -hmm. No, hasn't even been monetized or anything. I'm like, that guy knows something. Yeah. I need to get in here. So we had a meeting and I looked at it and I didn't know nothing about security software. So he he's and I, I said, we got to do, we got to monetize this like ASAP. We got to create a premium product and, and do it. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, what Limit Login Attempts does is it prevents 
uh, either bots or even humans from making excessive login attempts on your website. So, you know, if you, you know, just for example, if you try to log into your iPhone three times, what does it do? It kicks you out and it makes you wait like, you know, two hours to, to try right. again. It's a similar setup. If you put your login three times, you, you don't, you get kicked out you have to wait an hour or two to come back. So it throttles those IPs and to the point where some of these bots or, or humans, they just, they just move on. They go into their mm -hmm. next. It's actually one of the biggest problems in WordPress because a lot of people still don't use secure passwords. They're lazy. And it's not so much the site admins, it's the users of their websites that make quick accounts. They don't think about it. Then they get brute forced. They start injecting all this code and, and URLs. And I mean, rest is history. But um, we went real hard. I mean, we, we cut a premium product for it. And then uh, literally just overnight, we put it in play and, and subscribers start coming in. And granted, this was with zero marketing. This is just, you know, we have a million active users. So it's, mm. it's just sheer volume, right? And we make uh, around $10 uh, per month for each subscriber, but they can do annual and lifetime plans. So there's different, you know, economics right. to that. No, that makes a lot of sense because that's one of the things I was wondering about the 2 million active users versus the 5K paid subscribers. Or subscribers. So 2 million active users is a one-time purchase, I'm assuming. And then the 5K paid subscribers, is that a premium? So it, it's free to download the plugin. So okay. the, the so the reason why we don't have a lot of subscribers is because we started a little late. If gotcha. we would have started day one, I think we would probably have three to four times uh, that many. But um, it wasn't. But, you know, actually, it's sometimes good to build mm -hmm. up like, you know, Google is famous for this, right? They love to to get a ton of subscribers, you're giving free stuff, and then they turn around and and start charging you just like with Google Analytics. I'm sure you may have heard that now you're going to have to start paying for your previous data where in the past they've given all that data for free. So oh, I think I you get that. like, you're going to get like, I think two or three years worth of data. And if you want to keep the rest of it, you're going to have to pay them. So it makes a it's, lot of it's, sense. It's, it's, it's a strategy. And, and honestly, maybe it worked out best that we didn't, um, uh, you know, start monetizing, monetizing it, early. it earlier. Because uh, one big thing, the reason why I think we grew so fast is because GoDaddy pre-installs our plugin on every single one of their WordPress installs. Wow. Yeah. So that was when, when we found out that we're like, oh, wow, like this is, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is good, you know, but. You're like, I really love my partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he loves me because I, I'm the one that like. I get I, I get this bug up my ass and I'm like, dude, let's roll. Like this, yeah. this is money. Like, Execution. I, I told speed. him I told him gold. I said, this is gold. Like, wh what are we doing? And yeah. we, we didn't it didn't take long. I think three months we came up with the premium product and all, and, and had it launched right away. So um it's just like yeah. Jobs and Wozniak. You know, Wozniak would have never done what Jobs did. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. Wozniak was the genius behind it, right? So yeah, I think it's uh it's definitely a cool dynamic and it's rare. To find a pair like that so i'm excited for you brother okay so we connected um on your podcast mm -hmm. kevin invited me on he's in apex with me and uh he he invited me on kevin is a personality all by himself i feel like he could carry that thing if he wanted to oh yeah <laughs> but uh <laughs> and you and i started chopping it up a little bit and it turned into like oh we're not podcasting anymore me and me and greg are just nerding out on you know, his, his sales team, his systems, his operations, conversion mm -hmm. rates, closing rates, all that kind of stuff. We started getting into that conversation. And um, I was like, man, Greg is my people. I need to get him <laughs> on the Building Great Sales Teams podcast to talk about Trip Shock. And, yeah. uh, you know, I know it's an experience booking service. You guys do services like boating, water sports and stuff like that. Do you guys even need a sales team because the booking's done online? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so we, we have a call center for, um, people to call in mm -hmm. and, and make reservations and ask questions. Uh, if we eliminated our, our call center, it, I mean, we could still survive, um, mm -hmm. just with online booking because we do about 75%, but, um, considering the volume we do, you take away that 25% and that's, you know, that's significant. Plus, yeah. Uh, as we discussed on on you know our show, 
I track everything meticulously mm -hmm. from our call center. So I have uh, actually in the company, we have about 150 KPIs for all, all departments, but specifically on our call center, um, I can track because we use uh, tools to be able to track conversion from, from phone calls. I know mm -hmm. that 47% of people calling our reservation line convert. So okay. that's, I mean, that's almost 50% of calls are getting booked. And mm -hmm. at that number, now I, I don't have a whole lot to compare that with. And maybe you can even tell me if that's good or bad, but I will say um, looking at for just from history, I, I think that's a very strong number. And if it was 10% or 20%, that might change my mind of whether or not we need a call center. But right. the fact that People and when people call for a tour, you got to understand like a cheap tour that's you know ten fifteen dollars. They're not calling in for that. Right. They don't. They don't care if if it if it's a horrible tour. They're like, okay, I spent fifteen dollars, whatever. But when mm. they're spending four, five, six hundred, a thousand dollars on a tour, yeah. they want reassurance. It's not that they don't see the inform information's all there. They mm. want reassurance and talk to people, and that's the the pain point that we're solving with having a call center is mm -hmm. that to give them that additional reassurance and that, you know, paying a, a person to run the phones 15 to 17 an hour, yeah. it's 100% worth it because we're making two to $300 on a commission of uh, at a size of a thousand dollar booking. So, right. and we, we've seen a higher average order for um, people that call in opposed to people who book online. Yeah. It makes a, it makes a ton of sense. And, and, and I will tell you that whenever you, have an in-person sale, right? I'm sitting across from your kitchen table mm -hmm. or, you know, we're at a business somewhere and I, and you can read tonality, body length. You, you have all the tools, right? Yeah. Then a 40% closing rate is average. When you look at uh, telemarketing, right? You're, you're probably looking at, and this is inbound telemarketing. You're probably looking at a 30 to 35% closing rate. And then when you look at um, basically online, online sales, inbound mm -hmm. again you're probably i mean in your case you're probably at like i don't know i'm just guessing here like from first visit to sale maybe seven eight percent just guessing here uh a little lower it's probably more like around two and a half to three two and a half okay yeah that makes a lot more sense i didn't want to yeah. undershoot you and insult you, you know yeah it, it, but but you know um for, because they're like, just they're just browsing at the end of the day like most people are just browsing oh yeah you know? they're lo they're looking and yeah. some people use this as a planning resource too so like they, all, all that being said the fact that you're closing 47 percent and it's basically an inbound telemarketing call or an inbound phone call mm -hmm. is incredible because yep. we have people doing face-to-face -face sales you know and and the price tag is around a thousand dollars so that brings the conversion rate up right versus like you know, a solar system or an AC system or something like that is tens of thousands of dollars. Those convert a little lower because of the price tag, but it, it, it's still insane at 47%. That's an incredible conversion rate. So there is a caveat to that. And, okay. and Doug, you're going to appreciate this because it's back to our, our podcast. I actually, I have re-listened to our show the other day because I just, I wanted to kind of hear you and, and be prepared for the show. But okay. uh, we use uh, a service. We, we, we basically build our call center technology on Amazon. And when someone goes to call us, we don't just give them the phone number. We make them click a push to, you know, click the call. They fill out a short form. I get their email. I, uh, I get some inf basic information about them, why they're calling. So then we know, we know where to route it. So um, we pre-qualify that customer they don't they can't just get the number and, and go you right. know we want an are you a serious are you serious you really want to talk to us or do you mm -hmm. want to bullshit with yeah. us? so they have to fill that form out and sometimes they put fake stuff in there like fake emails just to kind of get to the yeah because they know the game they don't but want to get the emails afterwards or whatever yeah. the fact that there's that barrier mm -hmm. i believe that that is it's going to get us a better lead because they're having to fill it out and tell us kind of why they're calling and things like that. Now, could that be hurting our sales? I don't know, but we did test that. We did test it last year. I took the click the call off. I just put our phone number. We tested the, uh, the conversion rate and it was almost identical. So, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that, um, having that pre-qualification actually hurt 
anything. Mm -hmm. I do think the help, it, it definitely helps when it's really busy because it only is pushing through our better, um, right. Better quality. Like I, I was assuming that when we took it off, that's one very entry. Maybe we're going to get a lot more phone calls. It, it really didn't. Yeah. It, it actually stayed, um, about the same. Um, maybe, maybe it went down a little bit, but mm -hmm. I, I, we do, do feel like that kind of gives us less phone calls and get us higher, higher conversion rate. No, it makes a, makes a ton of sense. So, so how big is your uh, phones team? It can, it ranges. Sometimes it's as low as, uh, it's as low as 10. Mm -hmm. It can get as high as 20. We're seasonal. So July, August, it, it is a challenge for us from a hiring perspective because we have to ramp up and, and we have to train fast. Um, and, and, and we have a really unusual call times too. Like, you know, some, some bigger call centers, they're busy, you know, somewhat similar throughout the whole day where we are incredibly busy between eight and noon. Mm -hmm. Like we will, we will possibly take 80% of our phone calls in a short window. So we can't hire people and put them on the, the phones for, for two hours and tell them to go home, you know? Yeah. It, so it, it's the staffing is definitely a challenge. So we are like on a, typically we can't avoid like a longer wait time in the morning, which is another reason why we want to pre-qualify the customer even more yeah. and provide, you know, different options for them to contact us like chat. Cause we do have mm -hmm. a dedicated chat um, a rep as well. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So let me ask you this, you know, and this is just, it's not my solution for everything, but it yeah. is a solution, you know, for these types of things. Right. Because, you know, the deal is like you've, you're bringing them on full time, 15 an hour plus incentives and all that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at possibly outsourcing? Or are you worried about the conversion rate suffering if you did that just because of, you know, um, culture and stuff like that? Yeah. You know, so um, I'm not against outsourcing. Mm -hmm. And I know like for some people, like they're all about keeping it in the country, you know, yeah. made by American, by American kind of thing. Um, I'm not concerned so much about that, but when people are calling and they're talking to someone who is knowledgeable about these experiences, something that, you know, mothers typically our customers, mother, we have 70% of our, our people are, are calling our moms with kids that are concerned about the trip or they have questions and they get very detailed. Uh, I think we will lose our speed yeah. and our efficiency if we outsource because we have 1500 products. They all go mm -hmm. through a lot of training in order to learn those products. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that you can outsource it and it can be very similar, but um, we've always felt like you know the fact that we are knowledgeable and kind of have that built in and ingrained in our brand Mm -hmm. that we are all educated. We're here. Yeah. Uh, we know the products. Like, I feel like we would lose a little bit of that, but maybe okay. you can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> on that. No, I, I, yeah. I love your answer because I do think it's situational and the variables matter when you look at outsourcing. Right. And so like in, in my case, you know, the, the VAs that I do have, they have different responsibilities, right. But none of them are really customer facing. Um, it's social media director our mm -hmm. uh systems director social media uh assistant and uh systems designer right yep. and so basically those are fancy words for i've got a spreadsheet person i've got a social mm -hmm. media person and i've got uh my person that runs the whole team and she mm -hmm. does some go high level and crm stuff for me you know and so but all of that is very task oriented task based and you know we still try to create that culture within the team because we have a small team now versus before I had sales teams and everything. Um, but it made a lot of sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it is, and, and it is a beautiful thing to be, you know, at an event or at a client's office and Ryan's shooting media. And then the next day we already have a pot or a uh, Instagram reel cut up and rolling from the day before, you know what I'm saying? Cause they worked set different hours. And yeah. so, but in your case, I, I totally get that because it is, it's a, it's a cultural experience that, you know, someone that grew up in the U S or grew up in Florida in particular would understand. And maybe they've actually been on these trips and stuff like that. Cause their family grew up doing, they that. all, they all been on the, we invest in bringing them to the tours and trying them out. And when, when the customer hears that 
we've been on these tours, I think it changes the entire dynamic of the phone oh, call. Yeah. I've listened to phone calls. Oh, you've been on it? Great. Makes them feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah. Or they've been to the destination, are familiar with it. it mm -hmm. We're almost like travel agents in some yeah. respect when we're talking to them and helping them. And, and, and that a lot of times is an opportunity for us to upsell other things, which I, that's why I, I kind of love the phones is that you got them like you're talking to them and once you sell them on that boat tour now it's like hey you want to go parasailing or go on a uh -huh. snorkeling trip you know we really the average order is it definitely says it all to why it's very necessary to have a call center 100 percent. what are some other kpis that you discovered and once you started focusing on them and increasing or decreasing them you saw maybe that average order go up or the uh phone time drop down yeah so um, one of the, the KPIs that I find really interesting is our drop calls mm -hmm. and how those customers respond post drop call. Okay. And what we found is that most customers that drop do not come back and book. So 90% of our drop calls, they do not come back and book. And that to me is like one of the most profound numbers. So when I found that out, I'm like, okay, we have to figure this is granted. Like when we first did our phone system, every single phone call went to our new reservation line. We didn't separate it out from existing reservations, oh, new reservations, reason. marketing. Yeah. So when I saw that number, I'm like, we have to make sure that people that are calling because they already have a booking and they're lost and they can't find the tour or whatever. We can't make those people you know, get, get in the Go same the flow. flow. Yeah. yeah. We need to route those people out and make sure as many customers are getting into that new reservation line, they're waiting as few as or yeah. lowest as possible. So we made that change. And that, that was a dramatic shift by looking at the KPI data. We analyzed it. We saw a problem and mm -hmm. we, we addressed it. So now we have four different queues. We have new reservations. We have existing um, we have, if you're a, a tour op operator, you need help with your listings or you have an issue with a customer. And then we have another mailbox for just general inquiries, like people, like sales, people trying to sell us stuff. So we separated it out and we noticed that our new reservation line always had, it was always more staffed. I don't care if people wait 10 minutes because they're, they have a question about the tour that that goes a month from now, books. right? <laughs> they already pay. We already got their money. We don't need to <laughs> worry about them anymore. So they wait a little bit longer. It's okay. Yeah. You've already got a tour. You're booked. But yeah. I don't want my new cut people that have their credit card out. I do not want them to wait because I know if they drop, they're not going to book with us. So I knew it. I knew it all along. Whenever I call at t they put me in last because I'm already a customer. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> if they were smart, they would do it. Yeah. <laughs> So if no, you have that, an issue, if you have an issue and you're not getting through, yeah, the secret is to dial number one and go to the new customer line because you'll get through yeah. quickly. Yeah, now, they just what, don't what, give what? you the zero option anymore, right? No. <laughs> They're like, no, we're done with zero. <laughs> no, I love it, brother. And that that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that with us. And just to kind of like dial this down, you know, because a lot of our listeners are in home services. Some of them have call centers. And, and some of them operate call centers, so you're speaking their language. But other ones, it's like a, it's, it's, it's a roofing company. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And one of the first things I always have to ask prospects or clients is, what are your KPIs? What are your metrics? What are you tracking? And what yeah. story is it telling you? And typically, they, they're, they're not. They're tracking gross revenue, maybe gross revenue per rep, and then uh, their profit. And then, and then probably if they're in construction, the uh, cost of goods sold, you know? And so they're, they're, they're tracking the individual numbers to make sure they make money on each job, but they're not looking at the performance of the company overall. And then, okay, mm -hmm. all right, what's my average time to get the job done? And then the quality on the back end, right? How many of these customers uh, are doing one-star reviews, are giving complaints, are, uh, you know, not happy with their salesperson or we, you know, we do a survey after and they fill out a survey and they get two or three stars, you know, because that really tells the story of, all right, how do I improve my sales process? How do I improve yeah. my conversion rates along the way? And then one of the things you and I talked about on your podcast was, yeah, you need steps in your sales process. So, you know, when you're losing the customer, 
it, it makes total sense with a call center because you literally see a drop call. But there's mentally when a customer is in front of you or, you know, you're talking to a customer over the phone or, you know, you're DMing them on social media, whatever the case is, mentally you've lost them at some point. And that conversion rate is, is the only thing that's going to be able to tell you where you lost them so you can work on that, that conversion point, you know. And so, you know, with this show, typically get really tactical, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah. you know, obviously that leads into the mindset stuff, right? Because you go to a sales rep and you're like, why are you having a hard time with this conversion rate? And then what, yeah. what do they always do? They always give you this preconceived notion that they have about the customers you have coming in or the equipment or the tools they're using or the script, right? Yeah. Something's something's wrong in there and that's what they point to and in, in, in their mind that's what the issue is right yeah so the best response i can always give them is the data exactly the, the data can't lie so if i bring right. if i bring the data to them i say hey you're having an issue with this pivot point but you know when we look at the team average you're 20 percent you're you're 20 percent below the rest of the team you know what i'm saying but you're saying it's this issue but the rest of the team isn't having that and when I talked to the team about it, you know, they said it's because they're not saying this or they're not doing or whatever the case is. And now you've got mm -hmm. an actual action plan to increase that conversion rate, right? Yeah. You, you guys run into a lot of that too, I would, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's – we're always – every month, every department goes and they put in their KPIs. And, you know, mm -hmm. KPIs, they can be so simple. They can be, yeah. and they don't have to be all performance-based KPIs. Some of them are just like, well, one of our KPIs is like how many posts that our social media uh, manager do for the month. You know, it, it's accountability yeah. just as much as it is this performance. Are we doing everything we, we need to do mm -hmm. to elevate ourselves or maintain? Um, you know, one of the biggest things I tell people is to pay attention anywhere, anything you do, anywhere you go. Because if you do pay attention, then you'll start to see why companies do what they do. So the reason why I wanted, I was so big on re-engineering our call center with the different cues is because when you walk into a grocery store and you go to checkout, mm -hmm. why do they have the express lane? Why do they have the regular lanes? Why do they have the do-it-yourself lanes? There's a reason. They want to get you checked out as fast as possible. They don't want you to wait. I, how many times have you been to a grocery store? They didn't have enough people working there. There's lines every, there's three queues open. They're all line, or, uh, lanes open. All They're all big. Someone wants to buy a bottle of wine and a steak. Yeah. And I've seen them put that bottle of wine and steak back and leave because mm -hmm. they did not provide, you know, expedited queues for, for people that ready to put their cart out and buy, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's so uh, and, and when I went to Disney World, my kids, I, I've noticed Disney does this better than anybody of how, you know, they if you pay attention to what they do, you you can apply a lot of those principles to how they move people through how they create technology, you know, to make your experience better. So that yeah. way you want to come back and there's retention and even the smallest businesses can apply some of these things if you just if you just pay attention and look and see see what's going on and, and i tell you in your business you'll notice how many similarities there really are mm -hmm. anytime you have dead space in your sales process you got to fill it with something either entertaining or maybe an upsell along the way and you know you're you're 100 right i just went to uh what was it um over there by your neck of the woods um universal studios and islands yeah. of adventure mm -hmm. and uh i'm just I'm at that point in my life where like my kids are still of that age, you know what I mean? But I'm over yeah. it. I don't like people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just don't want to, I don't, I don't like being cattle called. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so we did our research, you know, my wife did a lot of research. Her sister did a lot of research and found out when were the times to go to certain places and all that good stuff. Right. We did the fast passes and everything. And, and so, um, but one of the things I did appreciate for the the rides that I couldn't do that stuff with, and that were long lines, is like a, a lot of the Harry Potter rides. Mm -hmm. Like they had experiences along the way, like when you were in line. Yeah. So what would be a 40 minute wait in line felt like 20 minutes because you were looking at the moving pictures or the displays that they had out. You know what I'm saying? There was yeah. air conditioning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so. 
So, so yeah, and and we look now. Let's apply that to your call center, right? Because mm-hmm. this was the same exact situation and uh, that we were in. So people, when when we didn't re, before we reengineered our phone call phone system, we did a smaller staff. We had 15, 20 minute waits during the summer. And I'm like, man, people are listening to this crappy music for 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah. What if I can do a better job of pre qualifying them in that 20 minute or 15 minute period? Mm-hmm. So it, it, you know, we created a bunch of comfort messages, which comfort messages, if you're new, I mean, you know what they are, but they're just little Mm -hmm. messages that explain something about your business. So like we talked about what payments, make sure you have your credit card out so we can expedite your order. Let's talk about all the fun things that you can do on our website. If you don't want to wait, go online and book. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, if they waited long enough, we had it where we gave them a promo code. Like we did all sorts of things to make it feel like they're not waiting, they're actually learning and they're having an experience. I mean, um, if you guys want a, a, something really funny, uh, call Gatorland in Orlando. Okay. They do a phenomenal job of their their on hold music. Like they have, <laughs> I guess their owner talks like in a Cajun voice yeah. and he it's hysterical. He's busting jokes and everything. And yeah. I didn't even realize I was on hold. I just was listening to this guy chalk it up. But um, again, like creating experience while they're waiting to prevent them from dropping. I don't have a, uh, not many of my calls are dropping. So I'm not going to the extremes yet to to try to keep people on the lines. Um, Also, I don't have, I have a 23 second queue time for my reservation line. I don't need to do much uh, regardless of that. But if it was five minutes, 10 minutes, I would be going back to the drawing board. Okay, waiting for five minutes. What can I do to entertain them or educate them or give them some helpful information so they stay on the line? And maybe when they get to the caller, now they know a few things that we didn't have to explain to them. So now my my agents are moving through, uh, you know, that that call faster because we we like we talked before. I'm it's churn and burn. Like we are built for speed in mm-hmm. our call center. I love it. I love that twenty three second stat. That's massive right there. Um, I was just thinking. This is you know I'm. ADD. So obviously my <laughs> place is, what if you hire, and then you could do this on in, in several different ways. You could do it in person when everybody's walking by the uh, charters and stuff like that. You could do it for content for your company, or you could do it for your whole music, which is hire a comedian to tell a story about your service. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And like, probably they have a personal story that they can tell about a service, but they just use it for your service. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so not only is it entertaining while they're on hold, but it's reaffirming that they need to go and do that service. You know what I'm saying? And so in creating that anyways. Well, that, that, you know, that, it's also something <laughs> memorable too. And, yeah. and, you know, I might even take you up on that because one of my, one of our um, suppliers, he's a, a entertainer. He, he's called, his name's Brandon Styles. He's a phenomenal entertainer. He's based uh-huh. in Foley, Alabama. He impersonates people and he has oh, an a illusionist on. show. Yes. So I might, what I might do is like have Brandon do like an, a show while people are on hold talking mm-hmm. about basically doing the comfort messages, but doing it in, in different, like he could do Morgan Freeman, Barack Obama, oh, Donald nice. Trump, just doing all of them. And I think people would just la- start laughing hysterically while they're on hold. Yeah. He could be like, like yeah, that- the CEO of TripShock asked me to do some comfort messages for you guys. So here we go. Let's do it. You know, <laughs> it's oh, Morgan gosh. Freeman. And it's, I'm going to, I'm I literally, after I get off this, I'm going to talk to my, my team about it. Cause we are getting in the summer where we do have, Wait Longer time. whole times. Yeah. 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 It's written and before, you know, Memorial Day, like we 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 get them out, but like June, July is when it starts going up. So this is like the perfect time to consider something like that. Absolutely. So side note, um, you have a son, right? I have uh an eight-year-old and I have a eleven year old daughter. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I think uh it was just your eight year old son's birthday, right? Yeah, they're actually their birthdays are a week apart. So yeah, oh, my cool. son, my son, yeah, my son's birthday uh it's the twenty fourth and my daughter is seventeen. Baby. Yeah, mine. The, the reason I asked because I was looking at your Facebook and I realized uh, it, your son's birthday is two days before mine. I'm, mine's the 26th. <laughs> oh, wow. So I was like, that's pretty cool. And then you yeah. guys went to, to Disney and we just went to Universal. So, you know, the universe leaves little clues that you're you're in the right place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I, I love it. I love going in, into the parks. I know some people, like you said, it, it is a pain in the ass sometimes. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's not many places at that age of my kids where you can go and both have fun together. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, like, so, and you go on the roller coasters and stuff like that. I mean, I could care less for the, 
theatrics of it, but like uh, mm -hmm. they do it right. Like they, they have, it's clean, yeah, uh, clean park, and and they know how to use the technology to enhance the experience. Uh, you know, and, and I, have, I have appreciation for for businesses uh, that that do that. Do right. I'm, I'm willing to spend money. I'm willing to spend money <laughs> for for places that do it right. So yeah, I mean, it's it's great. The theme parks, some most theme parks, they they, they do a good job of it. So. Yeah, I grew up with Fiesta Texas, so I wasn't ready for Universal Studios. I was just like, <laughs> this is another level, you know? Yeah. Here, um, here's the issue. So we're we're at the park, and you know exactly you should probably know exactly what I'm talking about when I say this. And you know, me and my wife decide every one of our kids is with a grandpa, a grandma, and, uh, an uncle, an aunt, or yeah. something. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thea and Theo, you know. And um, so we decided to go get a Duff beer, you know, like it's from the cartoon yeah yeah this, nothing this, special yeah, yeah. <laughs> take a picture with it and that's about what you get out of it you know mm -hmm. it's a super light lager but anyways um and we're talking to the bartender and it things finally calmed down and he was like uh so how did you guys like hell week and i'm like what are you talking about hell week you know isn't that what the navy seals do or something like that and he was <laughs> like no that's what we call this time right now that you guys are here it's right in between christmas and new year's eve and that is what we call Hell Week. <laughs> oh yeah, because <laughs> everybody if, goes during that time. Yeah, if we were talking uh, um, before that, I would have told you to change it to end of September or end of August or um, mm -hmm. right after Labor Day. That's when you want to go to those parks. It's hot as hell, but there's nobody there. So yeah, <laughs> no, I'm all for that. I live in Texas, so I, I get over. I know it's I'll a different deal, kind of I'll hot, deal but... with the heat. I'll deal yeah. with the heat. Um, I mean, there's ways around it, but yeah, it's, it's a whole going to those parks. Now it's a, it's a, it's a marathon. You really got to plan and, and prepare and, and know what you're doing. Otherwise you're going to be waiting in long lines and hot as hell and kids are going to be pissed off. It's yeah. <laughs> it's not like it was back in the day where you just walk up there and do it. It's, it's yeah. a whole new game. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, you recently, started kind of paying more attention. And then this is just another conversation I like to yeah, have yeah. about leadership in general, because I, I, I do, I believe great sales teams and just great companies in general are built by great leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you recently went on a, a health and fitness journey yeah. and lost 23 pounds. So congrats on that. It wasn't quite 23. It was, it was 17, but it feels like 23. Oh, <laughs> I'm just dyslexic. I'm slightly dyslexic. You know, oh, I found no, that out the other day. Yeah. And so I didn't transfer it, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, 17 pounds. So what inspired that? And then kind of what did you do to accomplish it? So um, it was December uh, of last year and I got on the scale. I don't, I don't get on the scale much. And mm -hmm. I saw that I was pushing, I'm 5'6". So I was pushing 170. I never was 170 in my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, I felt fine. You know, I didn't feel, but, you know, I get things from my wife. Hey, you know, you're, you better be careful. You're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, getting, yeah. big, you're getting big. Yeah. Um, and I, and, but my weight is distributed so evenly that it's a lot of people can't really see it. But when I look at photos of myself, I could really start seeing, especially in my face. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you know, um, I need to go the other way. I can't keep going this route. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and I was experiencing some just some brain fog and some other things that are probably mm -hmm. related to not eating very healthy. But um, I just kind of looked at myself and I said, you know, I, I'm better than this. Like I should I should be caring a lot about my health mm -hmm. because the thing is, is I hope to retire earlier than what the retirement age is. Right. Like I, I'm, I'm building my wealth to that level to where I, I can get out. I don't want to be in a position where here I worked my ass off, I get to a point where I have the freedom to actually spend the money and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But then I didn't take care of my health in those previous 10 years. And now I can't enjoy it. Like I, it really start kind of come full circle for me that mm -hmm. if I don't take care of myself, I don't, if I don't stop this and reverse it, then I'm going to find myself sitting on all this wealth without being able to enjoy it, which, I have family members that are kind of in that situation, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, I decided to, you know, just start dieting and exercising and, and really it, it started off just with, um, me cutting my calories down. So, 
Uh, I went online and I'm I'm a, I'm a data guy like like we had. <laughs> I, yeah. I looked at what you know how much how much calories that someone my size should be consuming, mm -hmm. and then I cut it by 500, and that was my daily calorie intake. I intermittent fasted, so I only ate between uh, noon and 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. Healthy meals, you know, cut out sugar. Um, I, I drink casually, but I you know during this whole process I I barely drank. Um, so, you know, not really any alcohol. So just by doing those things, and I, I walked a little bit, I just walked, you know, after, after my lunch at work, I always take a, a half mile walk. Uh, lately, mm -hmm. I've been actually running because as my health improves, I, I don't want to walk. I want to run, yeah. but I uh, started off slow and I lost 10 pounds in like two months. It, it came off quickly just from yeah. doing those basic things. Now, every person's DNA and body is different. Someone could do exactly what I did and maybe not get the response, but right. you know, I, I found that if you cut, I think three thousand calories out of your out of your diet a week, well, you you can lose a pound, you know. So that's pretty substantial. Lot, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of weight. So um, once I hit that point, when I lost that first ten pounds, I kind of plateaued, and then I started to exercise more heavily, mm -hmm. and I didn't I didn't diet, and, and I still ate anything I wanted. But mm -hmm. I just started to work out more. So I started to run instead of walk. I started to hit the rowing machine. Um, and then, you know, the rest is kind of history. I just been on that regiment for four months now. Just mm -hmm. uh, run. I, I run a mile pretty much every day after lunch. And then I do a 20 to 30 minute workout with light weightlifting and rowing um, right before I leave work. Push ups and sit ups every day, morning and night. So Damn, you guys have a, a gym at the office or? Yeah. Nice. Since none, none of my employees wanted to come to the office and take advantage of these 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 empty rooms, so I turned one into a uh, fitness center. So <laughs> I freaking love that. <laughs> so Man. I got a I got a rowing machine and and dumbbells and whatnot. So nice. Uh, yeah. So I've just been doing that. I'll tell you, like, um, it's it's doing the the workouts is not the problem. It's the motivation uh, to do it because I mean you got you got kids, dog. You're married, yeah. and I'm same situation. And I'll tell you, like we're probably in the most vulnerable position because like we're giving everything to them. Like they always, yeah. all of them come first. Right. And then like, if you're giving the family the time, then it's less time that you have available to work out and exercise. So, you know, that's the, the part that was challenging for me is like, how am I going to fit all this in and really mm -hmm. make it work well? But literally like doing push-ups and sit-ups takes five minutes in the morning. It takes five mm -hmm. minutes at night. Um, after lunch, typically most Americans, after they eat lunch, they have a break or they're taking time. And I mean, they can go yeah. and take a quick walk, right. You know, get 2000 yeah. steps in and then after need work, an hour for lunch, especially if you bring it. Yeah. And or instead of, <laughs> correct. <laughs> yeah. Instead of dicking around on your phone after work, go to the gym for 25 minutes and do like a high intensity workout. So, you know, it, it, it is, you know, motivation based, but it's, there's a lot of excuses that go in there. And I'll, I'll admit, like I made a lot of excuses prior to getting in there. Um, but you know, I, there is some truth to like when the older you get, the more responsibilities you have and you don't have the, the time that you did earlier. That's why a lot of people stop exercising when they get older because they just get inundated with so much shit. They get really into their jobs. Their kids got so much stuff going on. The wife wants mm -hmm. you to pick up so-and-so here and there. I mean, there's some days where it's hard to get out and, and exercise because after work, I immediately have to go and pick up someone from gymnastics or take my son somewhere. But right. A hundred percent, man. And I love how you've incorporated it into your work because it doesn't take any time away from the family. You know, for me, it's unfortunately for me, it's getting up at 4 a.m., 4.30 in the morning and getting it knocked out then, you know, like right now, me and my wife are doing 75 hard and uh, we just needed that adjustment. You know, we knew we were slipping again and we were like, hey, we need to kind of like adjust ourselves. If, if we have to do 75 hard once a year, every year, then so be it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if that's what we have to do to kind of like correct ourselves a little bit. Yeah. But but that's the thing. It does. It happens very slowly. And like you said, all of a sudden you look up and if you place your weight, you know, really well, like I, I did in my twenties too, as well. I mean, it was, it, it was the same thing. I looked up and all of a sudden I was 290 pounds, which is crazy wow. when you say you're 170 and that's, you know, yeah. cause I'm, I'm 5'10". I'm not that much taller, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, um, I, I, 
you know, I looked up and then I started seeing the pictures and looking back at the pictures and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, I got a big old belly. Like, yeah, I got a well, you, chin, you know, I, I'll, I'll sit and send you a message of what I looked like before and what I look like now. And you'll you'll see like it's yeah. it's pretty substantial. But the, the biggest message to everybody listening is, you know, some people that might be a little older than I am that are, that are listening to this is you do not want to be in a situation. And I'll have talked to so many people that. They've done well. They built all this this wealth up. They've done have amazing careers, and then they didn't take care of themselves. They drank a lot. They got obese. They have heart issues, and now they're in the best phase of their life. Like people will tell you that in your 60s and 70s, when you're retired and you have all this extra time, and then you can't do anything with it because your legs messed up and your heart's bad and you're mm-hmm. overweight, and and it's like like that's not a way to live, right? Like. Um, and that's my mindset now. My mindset now is that I, I want to be able to enjoy everything that I've built when I have a lot of time on my hands. Like nothing's worse than being locked, locked down or having some health issue because I was an idiot and didn't take care of myself and just focused solely on, you know, whatever's in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not hard. You know, having a healthy lifestyle, is, it really isn't that hard. Well, and that's the difference, right? It's become a lifestyle for you versus just a diet you did for 75 days like I'm doing right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the difference, right? Is to, and in one of the things I did retain was working out every day. But if you eat 3,500 calories a day, you're, you can work out every day all you want. You know what I'm saying? You're going to gain weight. <laughs> so I yeah. like, I like the calorie strategy for sure. What one thing too, is if you, if you have a bad week, and you mm-hmm. really messed up. Like, you know, I went to Disney, ate a bunch of ice cream. Luckily, I walked 10,000, well, yeah. I walked 20,000 steps a day. Yeah. I was I was sweating like hell. Like, it, it didn't gain anything. But if you have a really, really bad week and you just let yourself go and you need to reset, um, you know, consider fasting. Like a, like a you know, two or three day fast. And I, I actually, I did my first one because I did kind of have a, a weekend where I just, you know, my it was my, uh, actually my, my son's birthday party. Mm-hmm. We had, had freaking crappy food, pizza, <laughs> everything. So I said, you know what? I need to reset because this is a bad week. And yeah. I did a 48 hour fast and it really wasn't that bad. I thought I would, wouldn't be able to do it, but, um, got me reset. Um, got all that crap out of me. I went into ketosis and, and, and then I, you know, I felt great afterwards. So, um, yeah, yeah I've got a, a men's group that I'm in and, uh, it's, it's mainly centered around real estate, but yeah, it's health, wellness, legacy, all that stuff. And, um, most of the guys in there fast at least once a month for, uh, you know, one day, like multiple times a month, you know, mm-hmm. and, yeah, it's very uh, some, common. Some, some of them even do the 48 to 72 hour ones, you know, and, uh, it's something that has been on my mind a lot. And then once I finish 75 hard, I think I'm going to give it a shot. You know, I think I'll, uh, pass out right now if I work out two times a day and try and fast, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, did. I know there's I, a way to do it. I did yeah. work out while fasting and uh-huh. it was that second day i thought i would pass out when i but actually i got this like weird jolt of energy because really when you, apparently when your body goes into ketosis you you get you know you you get a boost of energy mm-hmm. i don't know how that all works anatomically but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah i got this boost of energy and i was like going hard like it was one of the really? best workouts i've ever had and that's after not eating for you know, a day and a half basically. So, um, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting, but it was really hard at the end. I'm like, Oh, just give me a freaking cheeseburger. And then I did, <laughs> I made the biggest mistake because when you get off of a uh, fast, you're not supposed to go into any heavy food. Well, my so wife strong. says, Hey, I uh, hope you're coming home soon. I got New York strips on the grill <laughs> cooking. Oh, like, what? So I get home and ate a uh, New York strip and it was, just it was so good but i knew i paid for it like my stomach is not <laughs> ready for that you're supposed to eat like soups and broth and stuff and yogurt the soft and come out of it coming yeah. out of it yeah uh, yeah that wasn't very a very good weekend but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right brother let's yeah. pivot a little bit here yeah, sure. uh, last question i got for you um and th- and this is something that you know i've been interested in for a while now i probably asked this question like 130 to 140 times <laughs> um it's it, it is it's the last question of my part and we and i feel like at this point like we've heard every answer but every now and then someone comes on and gives me a different answer i'm like oh shit, that really made me think so uh what does legacy mean to you and what legacy do you want to leave behind oh man um 
You know, legacy to me, the, the first word that popped in my head is preservation. Okay. Um, if you go really hard and, and take a ton of risk and lose everything at the end of your journey, when I, when I mean end of your journey, like you are getting to the point where you are incapable of really working anymore, mm -hmm. then you have, you know, is your legacy where you want it to be? Mm -hmm. You know, it, so I, I guess like preservation, meaning that the six, the success that you have, make sure that you're able to preserve mm -hmm. that success in some capacity, whether it be financially um, or whether it be just you know, recognition. Like if, if I created this incredible business and then it blew up, but I was innovative and I, I made a, a a mark on that industry, regardless mm -hmm. of what happened, that's pot, that's preservation. Mm -hmm. But if I was a fuck up and yeah. I got to that end and I blew all the money, I got people, people lost their jobs. They lost their homes. I, I, you know, was, um, you know, convicted for fraud, all that stuff. That's, that's not preservation. That's mm -hmm. just, that, that's destruction. Right. of your your legacy so yeah i think i think of what it comes down to preservation is making sure that you're building uh you know your your wealth and and your career and and your personal brand in a way that it can be preserved and passed on in some ways you know passing on can mean you know passing on the, the money for your kids passing mm -hmm. on information to to your younger employees and people that come well before your you know, well, after you're dead, they, they can use mm -hmm. what you're giving them. And that's what I, that's what it means to me. Yeah. No, I love it, man. The taking that body of work and making sure that it's protected and that Correct. you are able to pass it on. Right. A hundred percent. Brother, I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, gracing us with your knowledge. Uh, the KPIs was a really interesting conversation for me. And I hope our listeners got just as much as I did out of that for themselves because, uh, you know, and, and basically if you get anything out of it is, is go, go collect your numbers, track your numbers and, and, and start looking at what that data is telling you, because then you can start executing on it and actually make movement on the bottom line or movement on the top line. It, it mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. You can make, you can make changes in your company that um, you can see and That's they're not right. just, they're not just ideas or, you know, frou-frou as we like to call it. <laughs> Yeah. But again, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show, brother. Yeah, I enjoyed being here. All right. Let's get building. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. We really do appreciate it. As you know, we believe that great leaders build great teams. How do you become a great leader? You learn from the greats. Join us at the Million Dollar Mastermind put on by Ryan Stuman in Frisco, Texas, and learn everything that you need to learn to be that great leader. The link will be in the description below. As always, we ask that you like, share, and subscribe wherever you consume podcasts so you can stay up to date with the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. Let's get building.